Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Professor Inizio, for inviting me to this uh, course and to this university. It's the first time I visit the university, it's the first time I visit uh, Torino. Thank you very much to Professor Lisa Caparena that she uh, offered to me to, to come here during this autumn when we met in another meeting in uh, another part of Italy near Ancona, at uh, Porto Novo, during the meeting of uh, uh, Fondazione Fondation Nagoni. My uh, topic today is uh, Europe in times of geopolitics. And I will give you some of my thoughts regarding the risks and the challenges of the European Union, of the European integration, during these very difficult and complex times that we are living in. Let me start from the beginning, from the uh, launch of the European integration. The European integration, the European community, was uh, its name at that time, came into being around seven decades ago, in a period that the French called the Glorious Thirty. Then, during these uh, 30 years, growth and social welfare went hand in hand, and free democracies reflected an optimistic view or vision about the future of all of us. These advances were consolidated during the last quarter of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st under the umbrella of an increasingly integrated Europe, which at the same time took forward gradually its enlargement process. The disappearance of dictatorships in the south of Europe, in my own country, in Portugal, Greece, gave way to successive transition processes, and in the 80s, the new southern European democracies joined excited to a common project of a political nature, even if it's still fundamentally based on the integration of markets and the interconnection of our economies. A few, few years earlier, in 1973, Great Britain had overcome its own doubts regarding the European process and joined the club. And as you remember, they left in 2016. However, at that time, not everything was easy to go through the road of integration. It was necessary to overcome a serious economic crisis whose trigger was the oil crisis in the 70s which produced the so-called Eurosclerosis. But soon, at the beginning of the 80s, the European institutions found a way thanks to the launch of the project of a single market, upgrading the original common market of the European community through the promotion of the four freedoms. Free movement of goods, free movement of services, free movement of citizens, and free movement of capitals. Soon, this step forward was followed by the creation of the single currency, the euro. Thanks to this, Europe became, before the end of the century, a great commercial and investment power abroad which enjoyed a model of society invited by the rest of the world. Peace, with the exception of conflicts in the Western Balkans in the 90s, reigned in the western part of the continent. The security of Europeans was well protected by NATO, dominated then and now by our main ally, the United States. In 1992, the Treaty of Maastricht came into force, transforming the community into a more ambitious European Union. And in parallel, the dissolution of the Soviet Union kicked off further transition to democracy in the other part of our continent, in the former satellite countries of the URSS. As of 2004, 10 new member countries would land in a row in the European Union, and today, after Brexit, we are 27. It wasn't just changes that were taking place in Europe. 
the rules of the international economic order, were generally accepted almost everywhere. Once the Soviet model, in particular the Soviet economic model, disappeared. China embraced the views of Deng Xiaoping, its leader at the time, and began a modernization process to open to market economies and join the World Trade Organization in 2001. The process of globalization, driven by the extension of free trade, the liberalization of capital movements, and the birth of the Internet brought with it great opportunities. Although it did not bring radical changes to the governance of globalization, nor put forward solutions to regulate the increased migratory movements in an orderly manner. Certainly, the opening of borders and the elimination of trade barriers <coughs> sorry. Sorry, but I got a cough, so maybe I will have to stop another time to drink a little bit. So, this opening of borders and the elimination of trade barriers raise growth and reduce inequalities between advanced and emerging countries, <coughs> although at the same time these inequalities increase within many of them. The same thing. Oh. The same thing happened in our single market, but here in Europe, <coughs> the cohesion policy cautioned that impact. Digitalization began to transform activities also in the absence <coughs> of, of adequate regulations. Environmental sustainability was already a concern, but climate change did not yet show the current serious signs of deterioration. Finally, democracies expanded in many directions and we Europeans not only became world leaders in the export of goods, services and capital, but also succeeded in projecting on a global scale our values, our model of liberal democracy and the social market economy. The good coordination, particularly between France and Germany, together with the leadership of the then President of the Commission, Jacques Delors, marked the best moments of that period. Italy, during those years, was always on board, and Spain, that uh, became member of the EU in 1986, joined with enthusiastic support the progress of integration. With the passage of this very good period, to the new century, however, several important things changed. Our European Golden Age, during the 80s and 90s of the past century, was jeopardized by the division surrounding the Iraqi war in 2003 <coughs> and came to an end with the outbreak of the great economic crisis in 2008, which hit many of our countries particularly hard. We still remember very well how hard were the, con the consequences of this crisis. For that moment, until today, and almost without a moment of relief, the European Union has been hit by several economic recessions, Brexit, migration and refugee crisis, the pandemic, inflation caused by increases in energy prices and food products, and for a year and a half, by the invasion of Ukraine and the threat that Putin projects on our democracy and our model of society. What does the accumulation of the effects of so many almost simultaneous crises mean for the European project? In the heat of its effects, our confidence in the future and in the virtues of integration itself have suffered. We have to recognize it. Trust in democratic institutions suffered as well. From these shocks, the various versions of populism 
have tried to fish in troubled waters, trying to question not only the foundation of the European project, but also the very foundations of our democracy. Therefore, we live in a complex and confused times, and it's difficult to seek answers to many of the questions that arise from public and private debates. In the remainder of my speech, I will try to respond to some of those questions. Let me put from the beginning two questions. How these crises, the overlapping of many of those crises in the last decade and a half, affected the prospects of integration and our own security? Or, second question, what role should the European institutions play together with the democracies of the member states to strengthen the foundation of a solid, effective and secure European project aligned with expectations and ambitions of a restless, disoriented and even, even frightened public opinion? Let's start by the more serious challenge of the present days. So the most serious challenge now <coughs> is indeed war. And war has returned to European soil. Putin, since decided of forcibly recomposing the zone of influence of the former Russian Empire to suffocate the Russian population, to invade its neighbors, to threaten democracies, and to violate the most elementary rules of the United Nations Charter. Following its attacks in Georgia, Moldova and Crimea, Russia seeks now to conquer by force the other parts of the territory of Ukraine, which on its side is determined to defend the sovereignty and territorial integration or integrity of its territory. Ukrainian people identified strongly with democratic rules values and the European model of society and aspire to join the Union as soon as possible. It already has, for that purposes, the support of the EU. While recognizing our own defense fragility, the European Union cannot be indifferent to this conflict as long as the war cannot be concluded with a fair agreement consistent with our democratic commitment with Ukrainians, but unfortunately such agreement is not expected anytime soon. With the war, the geopolitical perspective that uh, President von der Leyen assumed at the beginning of her presidency of the European Commission, months before the Russian invasion, acquires a new dimension. European support for Ukraine must remain unequivocal, however great the effort it requires, and the difficulties in reaching a speedy end to the conflict. It's about defending liberal democracy, our own security, and the international order. The Putin victory would mean trampling on those values in Ukraine, but also a major threat within our European borders, returning to the most delicate moments of the Cold War. While protecting our security, the European Union must decide how to exercise our own responsibilities in the face of the fractures that the conflict in Ukraine highlights to us and even aggravates those tensions at the global level. The tensions generated by the war coincide in time with those derived from the global struggle between China and the US. In both cases, 
the Ukrainian war consequences and the tensions at the global level between the two big superpowers, we Europeans feel directly challenged. Therefore, we must calibrate our relations with both superpowers very carefully in order to protect our interests and increase our relevance at the global level. Our foreign and security policy must be consistent with that of our transatlantic allies, in particular the US, but not necessarily identical to that of Washington and other countries outside the EU. In the relationship with the US, the experience we lived during Trump's term between the last uh, four years before Biden is still very close. When Trump showed a deep contempt in transatlantic relations. <coughs> in November next year, the date of the next US elections, this situation could be repeated. Now, fortunately, President Biden looks at Europe with friendlier eyes, and his talk of the role of NATO and the EU bring us comfort. But, unfortunately, we are not sure that this comfort will go beyond November 2024. The strategy of the US with China, even if Biden is a good friend of us, does not always coincide with the one that best suits the Europeans. Therefore, our role is not to support Washington without nuance in its fight for hegemony against uh, China, although <coughs> we are convinced that we cannot seek equidistance between the two superpowers. So, we have to calibrate when we are not in agreement with Washington, but having in mind that Washington is our main ally. And we wish to continue this alliance. China is a great challenge for us, politically, economically, and technologically. But it is also in our interest to consider China as a partner. In official documents, the EU considers Beijing from the triple angle of partner, competitor, and rival, without prejudice always to the will to take care of transatlantic relations. I give you an example of what I mean. Bearing in mind that uh, we need to maintain these balances, President von der Leyen corrected the initial American idea of economic and technological decoupling between the West and China, and was able to convince President Biden to opt for a softer, if ambiguous, option of de-risking in their relations with China. Why is it so? On the one hand, the EU cannot ignore the size and the strategic importance of our trade and the stock of European investments in China. In addition, another crucial element is our external dependence on a long list of critical raw materials to produce clean technologies, such as solar panels or batteries for electric vehicles, which allow us to move towards a decarbonized economy. The concepts managed from the US to advance towards the risking <coughs> such as friendshoring and nearshoring do not clarify in the case of friendshoring who our friends would be or in the case of nearshoring how to guarantee the supply of essential products or technologies without having to resort to China or other countries far away from our continent. Jumping to a more global level, 
it's evident that the economic crisis, war, and geopolitical tensions have impacted a globalization that shows certain tendencies towards fragmentation. Martin Wolf, the well-known uh, senior journalist in the Financial Times, says we are moving towards a bipolarized economic system, with Washington and Beijing and its core. If this scenario consolidates, and we still don't know if it will, we will be forced to take the side of one of the poles, and for sure in this case we will be obliged to vote for the US side, renouncing to our relations with the other part, with China. How to place the EU in this scenario? Some relevant voices recently made public warnings about the consequences of these trends. Let me quote two examples coming from two top-level authorities of the world economy. <coughs> Kristalina Georgieva, the current managing director of the IMF, wrote in the last issue of Foreign Affairs, the well-known magazine on international relations issues. I quote, Collaboration among nations is critical in a more uncertain and shock-prone world. Yet, international cooperation is in retreat. <coughs> in its place, the world is witnessing the rise of fragmentation, a process that begins with increasing barriers to trade and investment, and in its extreme form, <coughs> can end with controls breaking into rival economic blocks, an outcome that risks reversing the transformative gains that global economic integration has produced so far. A few months before, in the same review, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Madame Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, wrote, <coughs> Economic interdependence is no longer seen as a virtue, it's seen as a vice. In the same article, however, she dismissed opinions announcing the end of globalization. I quote again, Talk of deglobalization remains a dot with the trade data. Total trade between US and China reached an all-time high of $691 billion in 2022, 24% higher than the figure in 2019, before the pandemic. But, a few days ago, the WTO last report announced that its, esti its estimates about exports growth this year have been reduced by 50%, 50, 50%, due to a slowdown in manufacturing industries and the impact of geopolitical tensions. So until now, it seems that the perceptions were ruining faster than the reality. But this new data does not allow firm conclusions. We need to be attentive. In any case, for Europe, it is not easy to escape the risks of being dragged by the pessimistic voices, talking about the fragmentation of the economic flows and the economic space. While the EU is a strong supporter of economic openness and multilateralism, it cannot be totally spurred of the consequences of the economic framework resulting from this centrifugal tensions. European competitiveness suffers from higher energy costs, lags behind in cutting-edge technologies, and is being hit by the enormous volume of public aid given by both the US and China to certain sectors and companies. And those flows of public aid, enormous flows of public aid, are distorting the so-called level playing field 
when it comes to observe the trade relations among countries. In addition to that, the big digital platforms and cutting edge digital technologies are or American or Chinese. The most advanced semiconductors are manufactured in Taiwan or in the US. Advances in artificial intelligence come from Silicon Valley or the eastern countries of our world. We Europeans must do something so that we are not left behind definitively. Here comes our objective of increasing our strategic autonomy. A concept used until now in the field of security and defense policy that are now extended to the need to reduce external dependencies in the industrial, energy and technological fields. The recomposition of value chains is an obligatory requirement for this, for which we Europeans will need to widen the channels to be able to finance our enormous needs of public and private investment to finance the green and digital transitions, to finance also the uh, support for research and development in this uh, cutting-edge sectors, and our efforts to attract talent and adapt professional qualifications to job offers. An orderly open of migration flows to cover these deficits seems obligatory because of our declining demography. Therefore, the quest for strategic autonomy entails the need for an industrial policy which will help us to compensate the decline in the size and efficiency of our manufacturing industrial sectors and give way to the new economic businesses and actors that will lead the economies of the 21st centuries. So far, the Union Industrial Policy responded, in many cases, we can understand why we need to respond, of course. But I have to say that in my view, most of the responses have a marked, markedly defensive orientation, if not protectionist. Read in a recent speech by the European Commissioner Breton in charge of industrial policy, internal market, defense, and others, I had the impression that his views are rather oriented in this defensive direction. His words try to be looking into the future, but at the end of the day, his proposals were closer to a defensive attitude for the maintenance of the status quo, more than oriented to build a new future for our industry. Obviously, if we want to qualify our autonomy our strategic autonomy as open, we cannot be only we cannot bet only on defensive measures. In any case, I must confess that harmonizing economic openness with the protection of our markets and the public support for certain investment projects is not an easy task. I recognize it. But I warn about the negative consequences of these defensive approaches. Let me give you some examples. In the recent years, some of the measures being adopted at the EU level are rules to submit some foreign investments to an ex ante screening or to control foreign subsidies from third countries that distort competition. The EU has also introduced a border tax adjustment to penalize imports of manufactured products with fewer emission restrictions. The EU has equipped with new anti-coercion instruments our toolbox of trade defense instruments and some measures are being prepared to control the export 
or dual use technologies to third countries. All these verbs control, example screening, penalize, instrument uh, to defense uh, uh, our industry from uh, abroad, the control of exports and uh, some technologies imply a defensive attitude. Only another measure, such as the relaxation of the control of our public aid, indicates a contrary attitude. But in this case, we are flex flexibilizing the analysis of how public aids within the single market given by EU member states can be stopped. Our uh, single market rules and our competition rules but this is not enough to uh, counteract the protectionist attitudes shown vis-à-vis -vis the others. The balance to be drawn between the need to find efficient ways to protect our interest from what comes from outside and the distortions that can be created within our economies risk being clearly negative. In other words, even though many reasons can justify at least some of these measures, we must also evaluate the risks involved with the use of such instruments as they can cause negative reactions and even retaliation by our competitors and rivals. In another vein, the new European regulations on digital markets and digital services complement the rules for our competition policy. The regulation of artificial intelligence is now also being discussed. We must hope that all of them will be effective in protecting companies and users within our borders without jeopardizing innovation. I will come back to this point later. As for the financial constraints of a strategic autonomy, there are several, several aspects to be considered. Among them is the financing of the transition towards a green and digital economy, I referred to it before. Estimates of resource requirements advance large amounts of money. Estimates are huge. To which must be added the enormous economic weight that will be assumed by our new commitments on defense and the support of Ukraine and other candidates for EU enlargement. These efforts will need to be funded during the next couple of decades, both by public and private channels. This will make necessary, among other things, to remove the remaining obstacles to a genuine European banking union and to finally create a single market for the movement of capitals that was one of the four essential freedoms of our single market that it doesn't exist up to now. In many of these areas, some progress has been made in recent years. I will not deny this. But many initiatives that were designed during the times of the previous big financial crisis, in the 2008, 2011, 2012, and so forth, have remained in the pipeline, removed from the agenda of priorities as soon as the economic crisis faded and growth returned. Since the most pressing problems arising from the 2008 to 2013, were overcome, the political determination to continue building a solid architecture of the economic and monetary union and the expansion of the single market to the domains where it still doesn't exist failed. In 2020, the pandemic once again tested the capacity of the European institutions. They were able to organize in a very short period of time the joint purchase of vaccines and their distribution to the member states, making full use of the possibilities offered by the present treaties. At the same time, the EU launched the new next generation EU with an innovative mechanism for the financing of those resources, 800 billion euros, 
financing these uh, amounts with the uh, asset, financial asset similar to euro bonds, and together with a methodology for the elaboration of national plans composed of investment projects and structural reforms within a framework of common agreed priorities. Last month, the European Commission published its second annual report on the implementation of the funds. As of now, 153 billion euros have been disbursed. Six million people benefited from uh, education and training schemes. A similar number were covered by protection measures against climate change related disasters. 1.4 million companies have received, directly received support, and 22 million megawatts hour in energy consumption has been saved. The Commission issued to fund these uh, plans more than 44 billion euros of EU green bonds, and this is not the end of the uh, process to fund the whole next generation EU from now till the end of 19, uh, 2026. But the agreement specifies that the initiative, the next generation EU, should not serve as a precedent for the future. In principle, it is a one-off, valid only until the end of 26. I very much hope that before that time comes, the European leaders will renew their support for the extension of this initiative or give it to a similar one. Now, a new question. What can we say about the steps the European Union should take from now on? The European elections will take place in June 24. Therefore, they are approaching and these elections will be followed immediately by changes at the top of the Commission, the Presidency of the European Council and the figure of the High Representative for Foreign and Security Affairs. To prepare for the challenges of the short and medium term, the Union is likely to maintain its current strategic priorities, Green Deal, Digital Transition and so on, reflecting on its shortcomings and weaknesses, and preparing the relevant instruments to achieve a strong and cohesive Europe internally and more externally relevant. This strategic agenda will lose credibility if it is not underpinned by solid pillars of a political nature, conveying an overall vision followed by political and economic commitments commensurate with the ambition expressed by EU leaders and national governments. No one wants to repeat the mistake of Brexit that nobody was thinking about the consequences of it. But it would be very negative if we are not able to think ahead about how to increase our internal position within the EU, how we need to adapt and reinforce our policies, and close the loopholes through which anti-Europeans creep in. Overlapping crises, the outbreak of the war, and strong geopolitical tensions have exposed serious damage to multilateralism and even signs of fragmentation or globalization, as I said before. Renewed European leadership must strive to rebuild the international order. No one better than the EU to take on our shoulders the task. In terms of security, the EU must know how to make progress in terms of defense and economic security without betting exclusively on the NATO umbrella or on the therapeutic virtues of free trade across borders. The single market remains incomplete 30 years after its supposed completion, and so is economic and monetary union. To the strategic objectives, defined at the beginning of the EU political cycle that ends in a few months, namely the Green Deal, improving competitiveness, protecting rights in the digital age, completing the single market and the economic and monetary union, defending democracy, and so on, 
we must now add support for Ukraine, which includes the new enlargement. How we have to design the architecture and the mechanisms to allow an efficient functioning of the new, new EU, an EU of 36 members, not only 27, in a new geopolitical context and with much greater internal heterogeneity. The commitments made in the last year with the approval of the applications for membership of Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia are in addition to those proclaimed in the past years with the countries of the Western Balkans without forgetting Turkey, that is still a candidate. The European Council discussed in Granada last week how to start managing the enormous complexity involved in setting this process and how. The reports of such discussion showed the political difficulties expressed by many member states. That indeed was not a surprise. It's not a positive new, but it's not a surprise. The leaders of the 27 will come back in their formal meeting in December to further discuss how to embark the EU in such a big enlargement. The complexity of the tasks ahead to successfully develop this endeavor is huge. Unlike previous cases, the opening of the EU doors to Ukraine is not being split from our humanitarian, economic, political and military support for its battle for survival in the face of Russian aggression. Therefore, the current uncertainties about how and which, within which time span a peace agreed by the key authorities can be achieved make it, make it very difficult to launch and develop on solid foundations a negotiation process that has a unique character. On top of this, I cannot imagine from the political standpoint that any other candidate of these eight or nine countries that will accompany Ukraine in the process of negotiation its integration can join the EU letting Ukraine outside. The first analysis of the political and institutional reforms that the EU will need to assimilate the accession of all these countries produces a feeling of vertigo. Crucial aspects of the current account of integration, such as the common agricultural policy, cohesion policy, the size of the EU budget, decision-making mechanisms, the composition of the Commission and Parliament, and so on, have to be addressed. What kind of adaptations and adjustments of the present status quo will be? Most probably, many of these decisions will require reform of the treaties. In any case, as any other enlargement process before, the unanimous vote of the member countries will be required many times over the years to move forward the procedures before any accession is agreed. Perhaps a reflection on the steps to be taken on the road to the full integration is necessary departing from our previous experiences. Gradualism in the path towards full membership seems to be a wise approach. Anyhow, we must learn from the mistakes made in the previous enlargements in 2004-2007 in the cases of Poland, Hungary and in other, at the other uh, level, for different reasons, Romania and Bulgaria. So as not to introduce problems within the EU for which there are no pre-established solutions in the EU treaties in the EU rules. The Green Deal will continue to be a priority that has to be addressed with the various tools at the disposal of common policies, coordination mechanisms at global level and the financial resources that we can provide. Symptoms of fatigue are beginning to be observed when it comes to moving towards the goal of total decarbonization of our economy by 2050. The sooner we can find a way to mobilize resources and efforts to overcome these symptoms of fatigue, the better. 
the ravages of climate change are already a reality. We see it every day in the news and increasingly in our own life experience. The speech delivered a few weeks ago in New York by the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, when he talked about the opening of health doors, referring to climate change, deserves to be disseminated by the media, social networks, or other channels, including schools and universities. Obviously, the current tiny EU budget cannot provide the financial resources to make possible the necessary investment, investments in research and development, clean technologies, restructuring you know, of value chains and infrastructures. Nor are other channels, such as the Next Generation Funds, Repower EU, or the European Investment Bank, financial capacity enough to fill the budgetary gaps. Public-private collaboration will be essential, for which it seems logical to accelerate the construction of the European single capital market and the approval of the third pillar of the banking union. I have already referred to the most important European rules for bringing order to digital markets. The Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, the implementation of which is already taking its first steps, in parallel with the enforcement of the traditional competition policy rules. So far, nothing guarantees that these standards, or others like them, will be assumed by the countries that lead the advances in technologies and business models at the forefront of digitalization. I trust that at least in the case of the US, its future regulations will be compatible with ours, as is generally the case with the present cooperation mechanisms that exist between competition agencies. However, the regulation of artificial intelligence, still pending, can also have increased harmful effects if we are not able to coordinate this legal framework before it's too late. I conclude now. In this period of successes, uh, crisis, geopolitical tensions, and with the war on the other side of our EU common borders, our security must be guaranteed, now more than ever, by a strong, cohesive and proactive Europe whose governments cultivate trust among themselves and towards the EU common institutions. Both levels, the EU level and the national level, must earn the trust and support of citizens who do not want to be ignored for decisions on which their own security depends. Only in this way will the European Union be able to achieve strategic objectives that are as ambitious as they are essential for our lives and for our future. The main driving force behind integration remains that defined many years ago by Schumann, in its famous declaration of 1950. I quote, Europe will not be built all at once or as a whole. It will be built through concrete achievements which first and foremost create de facto solidarity. Thanks to this approach, we Europeans have progressed along a path full of successes from the integration of the coal and steel markets in the 50s last, year, last century between six countries to the present European Union of 27 members. This union has much more complex responsibilities and political instruments than the ones were thought by the founding fathers at the beginning of the process. In addition, at times like these ones, where geopolitics dominates the relation between territories and states, we badly need a second driver, not only the original one that we have to preserve and to develop, but also a new driver, a new engine. Namely, a shared strategic vision in political terms, and in this case, it's no longer worth saying that the road 
is made by walking. We face great challenges to which European nation states do not have the capacity to respond unilaterally. Union among Europeans is therefore more necessary than ever with a view to the interior of our continent but also thinking of Europe at the global level. Individual countries cannot guarantee anymore by themselves the security of their citizens in face of war threats and geopolitical tensions. They cannot fight individually, they cannot fight individually against climate change. To be efficient, our regulations of digital markets and artificial intelligence needs to be completed with a supranational legal framework. We need to orderly manage migratory movements. We need collaboration among many partners. Multilateralism must be the way forward to pursue the reform of an international order in line with the demographic, political, economic and social changes that have taken place in the world since the end of the last World War in 1945. Our values and principles are subject to strong tensions, both within the EU as in many other democracies. And of course, the existence of autocratic or purely dictatorial political regimes endangers, endangers the peace, our freedoms, human rights, of more than half of the planet citizens. The idea of a strong and united Europe, which was born as a project of peace, freedom and democratic existence in the second half of the 20th century, is more necessary now than ever and deserves our support in order to leave our children a world at peace, a freer world, a more sustainable and safer world. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Mr. Almunia, for your very comprehensive uh, and, uh, speech. And uh, so you have identified the many challenges that the European Union is facing and also possible solutions. And, uh, and so, so let's immediately open the floor to your questions and to your thoughts and so on and so forth. So Mr. Arminia is more than ready to, to answer your questions and to listen to your thoughts. Yes. Hello, my name is Sara, I'm from Spain. And I wanted well, yes. to, to make a question. So you have uh, commented in many occasions the quality of the relationship between the European Union and Washington and how they are our greatest ally. But there are some who think that in reality this relationship has been more of a, a dependent relationship and an interest relationship and that maybe it could end when the United States and maybe don't need us. And while this happens, uh, the European Union, as you also said, has been uh, prioritizing uh, more social issues, uh, as for example the Agenda, the agenda 2030 represents. And in terms of security, without the um, support of the United States, we would be kind of lost. So in, in a way, we are obligated to support uh, Washington's decisions and also their mistakes, so we feel protected. Uh, don't you think that the European Union uh, should strong, make more strong uh, their uh, military capacity so we can have a greater relevance and our own voice in, in this um, problems that are happening now in the geopolitical uh, scene. Muchas gracias. gracias. Well, as I said, I think that the Europe has to calibrate, the Jewish to recalibrate 
uh, our relations with our main ally, that is uh, indeed the United States. Since the beginning of the integration process, at the end of the Second World War, uh, NATO, uh, and, uh, Atlantic Alliance was created at the, just at the end of the Second World War, four years after. The Europeans decided to uh, have trust in the US for our own security, for our own defense requirements. And nowadays, many things have changed since then. The world has changed, the US has changed in many aspects, we Europeans also have changed, so we need to adapt our security needs and the protection of our security to the new reality. But the question is that this will not be realistic if we consider that this change from the European perspective will mean immediately to cut the links with uh, the US through NATO. We have not the means for that. And any politician that will uh, face their voters, the citizens, the public opinion, saying to eliminate our dependency from the US to cover our security needs, we will need to increase our defense expenditures in X percent of the GDP. This will not reach the, uh, the trust. But at the same time, we cannot consider that only NATO will protect us. Because it can be the case <coughs> that for any or other reasons, one of the reasons can be the electoral results, sorry, the electoral results in the American elections, they will not wish to give us the support. How we conduct this process <coughs> sorry, to increase our autonomy, our autonomy, strategic autonomy, without a transition that will let Europe without protection is a very important issue not to be solved in one day, in four years, but to be included as one of the big objectives of our next decades. But uh, I have not the answer when we will be able to say, Washington, we don't need you to protect us. I cannot say when, but I feel <coughs> <coughs> well, this is becoming worse. I think this is a, a question that needs to be present in our analysis always. The same as for other reasons, we need to consider to eliminate certain external dependencies from fossil fuels, and we are working on this, for critical raw materials, up to the level we will be able to do so. So, for all that, we need to reinforce the relevance of the EU public uh, policies, and in particular, for security reasons, the EU foreign and security policies. We cannot have uh, made responsible, as it is today, Josep Borrell, High Representative, that cannot adopt decisions and he has to wait the orders of the bosses. And the bosses are uh, national governments that not always agree on what to be done, at which level, when, with uh, what kind of intensity. We need to reinforce the relevance of the European Union to defend our own interests, not only within our borders, but also outside our borders towards the west and towards the east and towards the south that is a extremely important thing what is going on in the south of this planet and we don't have the means now to have a very clear, relevant and viable strategy 
able to be implemented when needed. So there are a lot of tasks that are needed for the future of our European integration. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, there is one there. Ah, okay. Hi, I'm uh, Francesco Rassi. Where are you? And Turing. Ah, okay. I'm from Turing. Do you believe that the European people will elect the new, the next European Parliament with the composition that relaunches the constitutional process? Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, the uh, constitutional process that was launched at the beginning of the 2000s failed in 2005 because two referenda, one in France and the other in the Netherlands, had a negative result and we uh, lose at that time the possibility to have a, a clear-cut constitutional treaty. Now we have the Lisbon Treaty, that are two treaties that are uh, uh, second level uh, constitution for Europe, but it's not a real one. But uh, now the most important objective, strategic objective, apart the Green Deal, apart the di digital transition, apart uh, other elements, is enlargement. Because our security, apart the questions uh, of our relations with the US and all this, our security is under threat because of what is going on with the invasion of Ukraine. So, the political leaders, rightly so, they decided, okay, let's open the doors for an enlargement, a big enlargement. With Ukraine, the other two countries under direct threat from Russia, Georgia and uh, Moldova, and the Western Balkans that had been promised to become members of the EU, but uh, this enlargement was uh, uh, not running during the last uh, year. And now, together, this enlargement is again a political priority for years. This will not be a very short period uh, of time of negotiations. And this will require a lot of changes. I said uh, quickly uh, at the end of, of my, my presentation, some of those changes will require treaty change. But instead of building the house from the roof, let's prepare a constitution and after we will develop the constitution and we will deepen our integration. Now the process is bottom up. Let's have a success in an enlargement process that will be extremely complex and will require a lot of efforts together with efforts to fight against climate change and to fight against our loss of competitiveness because of the uh, uh, we are lagging behind in uh, clean uh, technologies and digital technologies and so on. Let's embrace this strategic objective, big strategic objective of enlargement, and let's produce the changes that are needed for the success of this strategic objective. It's a bottom-up process from my uh, philosophy of uh, looking at the integration process, I recognize I do prefer this uh, bottom-up approach than not the uh, top-down approach that unfortunately failed. Uh, I would be very happy if in 2005 we would uh, have been able to, to have a constitution, but uh, I, I, I do prefer the, the bottom-up approach. I think it's more realistic and more connected with the real challenges and with the real priorities. Thank you. I see a hand there. Yes. More than one. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Joelle, and first of all, thank you to be here. Uh, actually, I have two different uh, questions. Um, once Germany said that Europe has been forced uh, in crisis, and in your opinion, do you think that? the cruel invasion of Ukraine will bring EU to build a more centralized and concrete European Union's defense system. And the second question... <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, right. You're right. 
Yeah, yeah. 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 And the second question is related about the upcoming European elections. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez said that the extreme right can be defeated, but a lot of scholars are saying that climate crisis, the Ukraine's war, and that one in Israel right now um, has increased the cost of life, and inflation has pushed up the extreme. These factors have pushed up the far right parties, and so. Um, a right-wing majority in the EU Parliament could be a concrete possibility for many. Uh, in your opinion, do you think that uh, this could be a possible uh, scenario or the actual uh, European Union Parliament majority will resist to this European trend? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. For the first, I do not think that the next European Union of 36, in a gradual process of integration at the beginning, will not be from 27 to 36 in a row. It will be a gradual integration of these uh, nine countries. I do not think that will bring us a more centralized European Union. It's impossible. I think it will bring us a more heterogeneous, by definition, EU, a more flexible decision-making process for different members of the EU. Not everybody at the same level with the same capacity to decide on everything. In fact, the present union is not uh, a fully centralized union. Uh, there are seven members that are not members of, uh, of the Eurozone. There are some members that are not members of the Schengen space, there are some members that have not, uh, uh, some have, uh, still preserved some opt-outs, such as Denmark in uh, Justice and uh, uh, Home Affairs and so on. In the case of a more diverse uh, union, this will bring a more decentralized decision-making processes for a, a number of, uh, of activities. I think the core must be, in my view, the single market. So if a country would not be prepared to survive economically within the single market without a lot of exceptions, I think it's better for this country to wait, to be more prepared, to, to have a pre-accession uh, systems of uh, support and all this. But the, the single market, I think, is, a, is the real core of the, of the European integration in any case. Uh, Regarding the elections, what I think, I will tell you what I wish. I wish that the Senate will not have the possibility to influence the decisions in the uh, next uh, European Parliament. I don't know what will happen. Uh, uh, this situation is very complex. Uh, every day, uh, uh, three days ago, we have this uh, big, uh, big, big uh, shock and crisis because of the Hamas attack and the uh, uh, Israeli response to the attacks of Hamas, we don't know what will happen in this, uh, in this conflict in the coming weeks, uh, in the coming months. Hopefully it can be contained, but uh, I cannot be sure and what can be the consequences of all this in terms of the evolution of public opinion in European countries is still uh, too soon to, to be decided. The only thing I, I knew one of the law, maybe, uh, uh, on opinion poll, but I think it's carried out by the European Parliament, but I am not sure. I think some uh, European MPs told me that according to the last opinion poll uh, circulating through the corridors of uh, Brussels, of the different institutions, the uh, Popular Party plus seen right uh, at the European level will not be able to have uh, more influence than uh, now. But uh, who knows? I wish that the present pro-European coalition of the main big uh, uh, European wide political forces will be maintained because it's the way to ensure minimal stability in the orientation of the decisions of the European Parliament that is very relevant in all the topics that will require uh, a co-decision that are many. And if we advance towards uh, the elimination of unanimity in decisions, 
be it in foreign policy or in, uh, in tax uh, policies or in some other areas. Uh, it's very important to have a European Parliament that can contribute to the success of the European integration and not to stop or to go backwards in the European integration. But uh, I wish my wishes will be right. But, uh, I don't know. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, one there. I'm Arthur from the Netherlands, and I was wondering uh, if you could elaborate a bit on these democratic or, or the democratic organization of the EU right now, because one of the times that really frustrated me when I looked at EU politics was when Hungary held sort of the budget allocation hostage uh, recently, and I thought, how can we? ever move forward as a EU as long as it's still possible for single countries to uh, stop the progress of the European Union or Commission. Yes, thank you. I very much agree with your concerns and with your, with your worries. I think when the uh, Lisbon Treaty, the Treaty of... Oh, no, no, sorry. The present Treaty of the European Union was uh, adopted, was part of the old draft of the Constitutional Treaty, Article 8, if I remember well, says when a member state is not complying with the basic principles and values of, of the uh, liberal democracy and the respect of human rights and uh, uh, separation of powers and all this, uh, at the end of the procedure, they can be skipped from their voting rights, so suspended as a member. The problem is that uh, at the end of this procedure, according to the treaty, the country under investigation, under suspicion, is not voting against uh, uh, itself, but all the others have to agree. So it's unanimity minus one, and the one is the one under accusation. The problem is that we have two suspects right now, main suspects. We have Hungary and Poland. If Poland is under the scope of the investigation, Hungary will vote against. And if Hungary, or when Hungary is under the investigation, Poland votes again. And this blocks. There have been several decisions as a second best. Uh, some uh, funds have been suspended towards uh, Poland or towards Hungary because of uh, serious infractions. It's not to suspend the votes, it's to suspend the reception of funds. In some uh, uh, other occasions, the uh, Court of Justice in Luxembourg ruled against uh, one of those uh, member states, or Poland or, or Hungary, uh, but the reaction, in the case of Poland of course, had been in several occasions, had been to say, well, I will not respect the primacy of the European law above the national law. The most important legal framework for us is the Polish legal framework and not the decisions coming from the interpretation of the EU legal framework in Latin. What is against? the principles of integration, but uh, this is a difficult, the tricky issue, how to force a member state without the procedure to suspend the rights, because it's not working, how to force this member state to accept, in all cases, the decisions of the European Court of Justice. We have no answer. We have not enforcement capacity to stop this kind of uh, negative reaction of a member state. These elements, for sure, will need to be adjusted and improved during this enlargement process. We, knowing our experience in the previous enlargements, in particular Poland and Hungary in 2004, we cannot afford to open the doors and to bring within us new member states 
that will continue to discuss this question. We need a reform of the treaty in this case, for sure. And this enlargement is a fantastic opportunity to overcome the fears to modify the treaties when the modification is needed. So I fully agree with your concern. I hope this will be this will find a solution in the coming years. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I have a question about the EU enlargement. Yes, what's your name, please? Uh, Matteo. Matteo. Uh, so, uh, the EU needs to expand and uh, needs to expand faster. So, uh, there are um, regions of Europe that are, that are not under the European Union or either uh, NATO. So, uh, I'm thinking like uh, about um, countries like Moldova or Georgia. So, um, my question is, um, given that Europe needs to protect these countries to prevent uh, other conflicts uh, that may escalate, like uh, Transnistria or Ossetia, um, shouldn't uh, EU membership be um, a, facil a facilitated process, uh, um, given that now it's a really long and hard process? Um, and also, um, to, in order to prevent uh, um, undemocratic um, developments, uh, like in uh, recent years in Hungary or Poland, uh, would, it make, uh, would it make sense to adopt also an uh, expulsion uh, clause, uh, voted on majority uh, between nations? Because a country like Hungary, uh, if um, was to be expelled, um, expelled from the EU, would, uh, would be practically um, Capable of functioning because it would be isolated from everyone outside of itself. So, yes. Okay. Well, the new enlargement, as I said and repeated uh, at least twice, will need to be gradual and probably with a more innovative ways for the road towards full membership than the ones that we know for the previous announcements. Because the heterogeneity we know now uh, that is, a, is a, a real challenge of any announcement, but in this case heterogeneity will be multiplied by a factor of three or four given the nature, the conditions, the <coughs> traditions, the culture, the story of these uh, candidates. So, this has not been uh, prepared so far. The process to prepare how the enlargement will take place and which are the phases, which are the conditions to step up from phase one to phase two of the pre-accession, the conditions to become gradually integrated, not in a full uh, framework of uh, EU policies, but possibly with different degrees of participation in different EU policies. All this is starting to be discussed. I, I, I have not the, the solution in my, in my hands, and nobody has the, the solution so far. But obviously, these uh, conditions of the respect of the basic tenets, of the basic values and principles of the EU, is not negotiable. We need to be ready to transform the treaty to allow that everybody that will become member of the EU or that has become before member of the EU has to comply with the basic principles. We cannot accept. The modification of the present procedure, I think, is not difficult. It's a question of political will knowing that the reform of treaties require unanimity and knowing that among the 27 at least there are two members that will not be very happy to modify these procedures but this is a political process we have this uh, next weekend <coughs> elections in Poland I don't know the result but from now on till the end of the enlargement process 
will have elections, many elections in all the European countries. So politically, uh, we can uh, uh, observe in the next years changes, hopefully positive changes, to make possible the modification of uh, a treaty in this particular issue or in others. For instance, the unanimity in uh, uh, tax uh, policies or the unanimity in all the decisions of uh, foreign affairs. So, okay. regarding exclusion, uh, I, I will uh, not in favor of the uh, decision of member states to say, no, you out. Yeah. I think uh, politically it's wiser to convince the members that they need to respect the rules, to be respectful with the values, to be respectful with the decisions by the Court of Justice, and so on and so forth. And the conditionality to receive uh, advantages of the members of, uh, of the EU there have been some, some steps uh, that have been agreed to suspend uh, the funds, cohesion funds, or to suspend uh, the next generation funds in some cases for Poland and for Hungary. This is not the best uh, solution, but it is a solution in many cases that can create pressure, not only peer pressure from the other members, but economic pressure <coughs> losing the advantages of becoming a member of the of the EU. So there are uh, measures that need to be reinforced to uh, obtain the result of uh, compliance with the basic principle, value, rules and so on, but they are not in favour of uh, excluding one another. I think uh, this would create very bad uh, feelings. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, there is one there. <laughs> Two questions and I have one also. Hi, my name is Arsalan. I'm, I'm from Persia. I had a question. Um, Excuse me, from where? Persia, Iran. Okay. Iran has become a name a bit infamous, so we are using Persia to replace it. Uh, my question is this. What will be EU reaction to Hamas terrorist attacks and Israeli right to defend itself beside big talks and speeches? especially when the claims of war are expected to go further as we look into the Middle East, Syria, um, Assad, Syria, as well as Lebanon, and who knows, even Egypt may join, in, may join in. What will be your reaction beside, it depends and we have to see, what will be your solid reaction beside big talks and speeches when the biggest um, democracy in the Middle East is in danger? Especially when we are seeing many riots and speeches in the Germany, France, and who knows, maybe sooner or later in Italy, by a group of people being anti-Semitic. Um, uh, sorry, I pronounced it wrong. They say, catch the Jews, kill the Jews, F the Jews, etc. I know we all respect uh, free speech, but this I don't think will really be tolerable. What is your reaction and your... Um, stand on this point? Well, uh, the ministers of foreign affairs, if I am not wrong, are meeting today at the EU level to set up a position of the EU. So far, in the last uh, couple of days, they were very, very quick reactions. Some of those reactions were completely wrong. For instance, the decision, individual decision of one commissioner uh, to cut the economic support to the Palestinians in Gaza because the missiles uh, and the actions, the, the killings uh, protagonized by Hamas. I think it was a, a big error of the commission. And I hope today the EU formally will start to set up a common position how to deal with this very very difficult and in some case very dangerous evolution of uh, developments as you mentioned with a lot of uh, countries in the region 
aligned with one or with the others and with tensions. And I think the European Union is always a product of peace, and peace and human rights should be on the forefront of any kind of reaction. Uh, my opinion, I think the uh, aggression of Hamas the other day was uh, completely uh, deserving a stronger condemnation as to kill young people that is in a, in a rave it is terrible this cannot be uh, explained cannot be justified by any kind of political uh, uh, suffering of the Palestinian population or whatever this is a criminal action that require a full condemnation. And the reaction of uh, uh, Israel, if it's uh, as terrible as I read uh, yesterday evening, to isolate completely Gaza with more than two million people suffering for many years there, and now letting them without electricity, without food, without any kind of uh, means of sur sur survival, is also a terrible. We can understand that uh, uh, Israel will react to the attack, to the citizens and to the territory, but not all kinds of reactions can be justified, even in these uh, difficult moments. Regarding opinions, uh, well, in Europe uh, there are many opinions in almost all our countries. Uh, in my own country, there are some people strongly committed to the support of the Palestinian people, but not all of those, of those people can justify Hamas actions. Most of them, most of the supporters of Palestinians are not supporting the Hamas actions, and this happens in all the countries. And not all the supporters of the right of Israel to have its own uh, security and its own uh, state can justify some of the actions of Israel not in particular during this uh, couple of days, but in the history of uh, the Israeli attacks against uh, Palestinians. You know? It's a very complex, uh, a very complex uh, uh, situation since many years. You know? uh, the problem of Europe as an EU is that we have not been able, the EU as such, to be influential for the good evolution of this conflict. Experience shows that the ones who were really influential to advance towards a more peaceful solutions for the problems between uh, Israel and the Palestinians were the United States in some, in some of uh, its initiatives, of their initiatives. But unfortunately those initiatives always failed at the end. And in some occasions, at the very end, when almost the agreement was built on solid basis and uh, with very, very reasonable conditions, finally the agreement couldn't, uh, couldn't be uh, finally signed and, uh, and developed. It's, uh, as Europeans, it's one of the arguments, not the only one of course, but one of the arguments to think how we can be more relevant when supporting our values outside our borders. We have some problems within our borders, but also we need to, to think and to elaborate how the future of the European Union can make us more relevant to participate in a positive way to contribute to a solution of this very, very complex problem. Yes, there is another one. Hello, uh, I'm Julian, I'm from London. Um, on this question of de-risking, uh, you said that defensive approach uh, has like, come to dominate in Brussels. Is it a budgetary question, uh, a cultural question, and how do you see it evolving post-enlightenment? Uh, post the risking. Well, so I, I said quickly, when mentioning the risk, I said an ambiguous concept. What can be uh, done to reduce the risks in our relations with China in particular? 
not only but in particular in China. In my view, the most important element from the EU point of view is to restructure the value chains of the uh, inputs that we will need to advance towards decarbonization of our economy. In many uh, of those value chains, we are strongly dependent on China, and we need to find a way to reduce our dependency, if possible. In other cases, it's not possible, but how we can organize a good constructive relation between the EU and China to maintain the possibility of the supply of inputs that we need to um, further promote renewables, to further promote clean technologies, to advance towards uh, a decarbonized economy and a net zero economy in 2050. It's not easy, but the problem is that for years and years the Chinese were aware that those critical raw materials were crucial. In some cases they have, in its own territory, these raw materials. In other cases, no. In other cases, they invested abroad, in Africa or in other parts of the world, and they invested in refining industries to prepare those raw materials so as to be used in uh, clean technologies. 20 years ago, Europe was a strong producer of solar panels. And now we depend in the EU. More than 90% of our imports comes from China. In solar panels, that is not a very cutting edge uh, technology, we were able to produce here in Europe, but now we are not. Uh, batteries for electric vehicles, the same. We will be able to readapt this value change, not to be fully dependent of, uh, of China, to, to produce uh, uh, batteries for electric vehicles. So far, we are not. And now, with the next generation funds, uh, several projects of investing in, in uh, these uh, big factories to produce uh, batteries for electric vehicles, but now the Chinese are becoming the leaders of the world in the production of electric vehicles. And they are exporting more and more electric vehicles to our markets, creating problems for the European automobile industries, where one of the industries where we were the leaders of the world. So we need to, to have this kind of uh, vision, medium term or even long term vision, of course, resources, technological capacities, and this is a good industrial policy, in my view. The bad one is to put barriers and to say, no, no, please, uh, Chinese, don't come here. They are coming, in any case. If you don't buy them uh, the inputs, they produce the electric vehicles, the electric batteries, and everything, even uh, uh, these, uh, how do you call it in English, uh, heat pumps. It's not very complex to, to produce the heat pump, and everybody says we need to further develop the use of heat pumps uh, as a very efficient way to uh, consume uh, energy without sending CO2 to the atmosphere. But why, why we were not prepared to produce uh, heat pumps? Uh, and it, this is not a question of, uh, of uh, raw materials, apparently. It's more a question of uh, skills, technical capacities. How we can be dependent of others when we have our means and our <coughs> tools to increase our uh, training and our uh, educational uh, schemes to have a labor force that is prepared for the new technologies that we will need. So all these kind of things are needed and the risking covers in my view, all these things. Value chain, uh, skills capacities, technological capacities, uh, diversification of, uh, of supplies from other parts of the world. But we'll be very happy if they can 
they make an export to us raw materials or refined materials or uh, products that we will need that we will not, we are not able to produce uh, here. And in exchange, we can organize a new free trade agreement with them with uh, some uh, element that we can provide to them, and they they need the uh, opening of the European markets in the uh, I think this is a, a good industrial policy. <coughs> okay, so uh, there is a question from me, if I may, and uh, it's to take advantage a little bit of your perspective as um, a Spanish observer, a Spanish citizen, uh, and you know, this program includes also a seminar series titled EU Voices, which is focused on the European Union scene from its member countries, from member states. So, and this is important because the European integration process is the result of different priorities, different interests, different perspectives, and so on. And on the other hand, uh, in the turbulent times and difficult times that you have described, it is important uh, uh, to understand what uh, uh, member countries, each member countries, uh, can do and should do for the advancement of European integration and uh, to strengthen the EU's role in the world. So Spain now uh, holds the rotating presidency of the European Union. So in your opinion, what is the possible and uh, the contribution of Spain in this respect, and uh, what uh, should it do for this, in this respect? Yeah, thank you, Giovanni. Well, the rotating presidencies right now, since the Lisbon Treaty came into force, the President of the European Council and the High Representative is not as powerful as it, as it was in the past. So on uh, foreign affairs, security issues, the role of the, European, of the rotating presidency is almost zero. It's not zero, but almost zero. In terms of uh, questions to be discussed and agreed at the level of the European Council that be, are becoming more and more numerous because the decision making at the EU is concentrating more and more in the hands of the leaders of the European Council and their direct staff. This weakens the capacity to influence of the rotating presidency. In the case of Spain, well, first of all, the uh, rotating presidency started in July before our last elections with the summit with Latin American and Caribbean countries. This is one important issue, not only for Spain, Portugal, but also for Italy, for France, for Germany, for other countries that are interested in reestablishing and improving the way Latin American countries interact with the, the EU. And this has been, I think, a, a good a summit that Unfortunately, every Spanish presidency tries to put uh, Latin America relations uh, on top as a priority, but the other rotating presidencies are not very interested in this. Let's hope that in this case, because of the creation of a permanent unit to keep in touch both uh, sides, will improve the, the situation. What else? Uh, Spain has a lot of interest in uh, agreements on migration. And, uh, well, curiously enough, the other day in the Council, the Correspondent Council, there was an agreement, qualified majority, with uh, uh, Pol uh, Poland and Hungary against, and three other countries, Austria, Slovakia, and the third one, I don't remember, abstained, but the, at the legal level, the agreement is done, but only waiting for the European Parliament, but I hope it will, will be done. Whereas in the statement of the Granada summit during the past weekend, because there's a statement required unanimity, 
the Poland and Hungary were against and they were not. But this migration, I think, will advance with uh, caveats, with some uh, uh, limits, but will advance in a good uh, in a good way. What else? <coughs> the reform of the electricity markets regulation. I don't know if this will be agreed in, uh, in the, during the Spanish presidency, but the uh, vice president in charge of uh, climate change issues, Teresa Rivera, is pushing hard to reach agreement or at least to advance the uh, state of the discussions for us to, to put on the table of the next presidency, the Belgian presidency, to be, to be agreed. The reform of the fiscal rules of the Stability and Growth Pact. Let's see if this can be agreed or at least advanced for an agreement during the Belgian presidency, but uh, the Vice President and the Minister for Economy, Nadia Calvino, is working hard to advance towards the, the adoption of new fiscal rules. What else? Uh, I don't know what, what else. M many other... Uh, but the, the most important issues, and of course, the role of Spain during the Granada discussions the other day, first, the first day in the uh, Conferencia Politica Europa, European Political Conference, mm -hmm. uh, an informal gathering, but uh, Spain played a, a role, and uh, during the informal summit of the 27th, was not fully successful because of these uh, disagreements when the decision requires unanimity. This is the problem of the European Council, by the way. If decisions require unanimity, you cannot adopt the decisions. And more and more decisions are going to the table of the head of state and government. So more and more issues at the political level requires unanimity before the qualified majority procedures, the co-decision works and allow the adoption of regulations or, or directives. Well, but uh, again, it's, it's not a very relevant semester. On top of this, from the political point of view in Spain, well, we had elections the first month of the presidency, so the role, the pedagogic role, the communication role of informal meetings of ministers in different uh, cities and to, to discuss on many issues has been overshadowed by the uh, political debates and, uh, among uh, political parties in Spain before the elections, during the campaign, and after the elections, because the climate is very limited in the Spanish politics, to be elegant to describe <laughs> the situation. Okay, so thank you very much. Our time is over. Mm -hmm. Our time is over. Thank you very much, Mr. Almunia, for your important contribution to, to, you know, to our debate, to our knowledge, and to, to, and to the program also, to Region Europe. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for my voice, but I still keep a little bit for the afternoon. Thank you.